British politics is dysfunctional. Really, really dysfunctional. If it is, it's certainly behind you, Prime Minister. The Conservatives spent decades tearing themselves apart over the UK's place in Europe, culminating in the incredibly controversial outcome of Brexit. It forced a lot of senior Conservatives to effectively leave politics, and in some cases even the party. And on the other side of the aisle, Labour has been consumed by an ideological conflict between the centre and left of the party. Meanwhile, voters themselves have been unsure where to go. The Liberal Democrats were catapulted into government for the first time in 2010, and then in 2015 support surged for UKIP. Then, just two years later, the combined vote for the two main parties was the highest for decades. And just two years after that, the Wed Wall fell, and Labour won its lowest number of seats since 1935. These were just some of the biggest shifts. But why? It's impossible to attribute this dysfunction to just one cause, but one factor really does stand tall above the others, first past the post. Many countries don't use this voting system. It's not even used throughout the UK. Scotland and Wales don't use it in regional elections. And for good reason. It's not the root of all evil, but it's pretty close. The British people simply cannot be divided into two parties, but the voting system forces them to be. It causes a severe disconnect between what citizens actually want and how the country is governed. Only three governments have won the support of a majority of voters, and two of them were way back in the 1930s. Unusual results led to a coalition government in 2010, but besides these exceptions, the norm is for almost every government to be supported by only a minority of voters. Since 1997, on average 28% of voters don't vote for one of the two main parties. But, most of the time, the parties they vote for don't get anywhere near the seats they deserve according to their vote share. And this impacts parties on all sides of the political spectrum. In 2010, the centrist Liberal Democrats won 23% of the vote, but under 9% of the seats. And in 2015, the right-wing UKIP won 12.6% of the vote, while the Greens won 3.8. But each won only a single seat. Because of this, many people feel compelled to vote for one of the two main parties, even if they prefer one of the other parties. They support the lesser of two evils, hoping to keep the worst party out of power. And presented with such poor options, many more opt simply not to vote at all, feeling disenfranchised whatever they do. But the dysfunction doesn't just come from the lack of voter choice. That lack of choice also drives very deep and painful wedges within the two main parties. Just as voters settle for the least worst party, so do many politicians. The result is that the two main parties are unhappy marriages of factions with very different visions for the UK. Among Conservatives for so long, the divide was Europe. Most accepted European integration, even with a few reservations, while a very vocal minority saw it as a threat to British democracy and identity. That eventually produced Brexit and everything which has come with it. And now, with an influx of Northern Conservative MPs, a further divide has emerged, between the very different priorities of Northern and Southern Conservative MPs. Labour hasn't been without its divisions either. Tony Blair brought the party to the centre in the 1990s, much to the displeasure of the party's left. That largely held until the 2010s, when efforts to shift the party to the left gained momentum. Initially, in 2010, the more progressive Ed Miliband defeated the more centrist David Miliband. And then, in 2015, the more radical Jeremy Corbyn won the leadership. While he enjoyed the membership support, he was never fully accepted by Labour MPs. Eventually, he was replaced by Keir Starmer in 2020, who signalled a return to the centre and has marginalised the left. In a lot of countries, the two parties would have split into smaller parties long ago, and they might be a lot happier for it. They'd be free to put their heartfelt message to the public, and voters would be free to give them their support or look elsewhere. 
The party landscape of Germany is particularly helpful in getting a sense of what that might well look like, with viable parties across the political spectrum from left to right. But today, voters and politicians alike have to calculate a complex triangulation to work out which of the two main parties isn't quite as bad as the other, or just give up. And unsurprisingly, this yields dysfunction. Thankfully, there is a solution. Proportional representation, or PR, is sometimes presented as a panacea which will herald a kind of utopia. That would be going too far, it won't solve every problem, and it's important to remember that political conflict is an inevitable and healthy part of democracy. But it would also be wrong to dismiss it as a meaningless procedural change. It really would transform the political landscape giving people a much stronger voice with choices they've never had before, and would go a long way to fix a lot of the dysfunction the country faces. And lastly, it's worth noting that it's easy to get stuck in the weeds of the upsides and downsides of proportional representation. It's not a perfect system, nothing is. But there's more than enough varieties to choose from, several of which are perfectly well suited to the UK, including the preservation of local constituencies. Most importantly, they all pass the basic test of being better than first past the post. So a lot of the dysfunction of British politics stems from the basic fact that the voting system doesn't reflect the actual preferences of voters. It forces both voters and politicians into unhappy marriages of convenience, which, unsurprisingly, produce a lot of dysfunction. Proportional representation can't fix everything, but it could go a long way towards putting to bed a lot of this dysfunction, and would allow citizens to feel that the political system does at least better respect their preferences. This could bring about a more healthy democracy with better outcomes for society.